Oi. Hi. we can always we can always uh, edit the, the recording yeah so i turned the recording on i've turned it on to rec to to record it in the cloud so even if my computer crashed it won't be a problem uh it will still be still carry on recording so if anybody has it has a connection problem don't worry uh you can always just exit and then reconnect again it's not a big deal and because we've pre-recorded the videos, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. I mean, the worst came to the worst. If it happens during the Q&A, then we'll just switch to a different question or a different person answering. I presume there will be participants joining from outside Hong Kong. Is that correct? Uh, just, did we, did we have any non-Hong Kong registrations? Uh, yes, I, I have some, I see from the domain name of the email address is uh, from Russia. I think okay. five of them. So. Interesting. Interesting. Russia. So, th those are the startups, I think. Okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. So we, in theory, people can can register from anywhere in the world. Yeah. And then, just did you share with everybody the breakdown? I think you did in in the to the panelists, right? Yeah, to the panelists. That's right. So it's, it, I, it's to me a pretty good spread. My, my general concern with events like this is that it's, it's dominated by academics or students, but I don't think that's the case this time. We have quite, quite a good public sector general representation, which is, is what I like to see. Yeah. Because I think at this stage, it's, it's frankly more about the public sector, <laughs> although obviously the private sector is, is probably the key user of the sort of data that we're talking about. <clears throat> okay, I hope you've all got some water nearby. Ah, oh, Eric's here. You're still on mute, Eric. You wanna check? Hello, how are you? Hi. So what we're gonna do, Eric, is release the playlists in sequence so that, uh, so just we'll share the playlist for your video just before I start playing it. So, and so logic will be if anybody has difficulty with the Zoom connection, they can just go to YouTube and watch it there. But I was explaining to them that you're actually more experienced in doing Zoom, live Zoom teaching than I am. I, I, I don't like it. I just try to do pre recorded videos. But you do a lot, right? A lot. I spend most of my day on Zoom, unfortunately. <laughs> So, Professor Eric, would you like to try sharing your screen if you need it when answering a question? Uh, sure. I, let me pull up something to share. <laughs> Eric, because we have two Erics here, oh, yes. we will refer to PCPD Eric and Hong Kong U Eric, okay? Should I rename myself then? <laughs> It's up to you. You can put Hong Kong U at the front of your name, but... I, I think that would just make it clear for other... Sure. Other, yeah. so, Actually, I thought I changed. Yeah, you changed, but but now it's back to only your name. That's a bit weird. I have. A, I'm not sure. I thought when I looked at this before, I, as, as I said, I thought no. Here it's saying. Oh, I see. So when you actually see the video, it's putting my name. But when you can't see the video, so if I turn my video off. Ah, oh, that's right. Does it change now to Hong Kong U? No. If you want to make a picture. Yeah, it's just the picture. If you want to make me a co-host, I can also, sometimes I do things in the background um, that I'm very good at um, to make but, things go smoother. So do I change this just in my, so my profile, Eric, I've already changed. 
Yeah, you should. You can go under the three dots, the ellipse, and go under rename, and then you can rename your yourself, and then your then it will rename. Oh, I see. So, so this is different to yeah. what it says in my profile. Exactly. You can you can have it uh, be different per session. Oh, I see. So this is a session based one, is it? Yeah. Now it. Yeah. Now oh, okay. Work on you. Oh, that's weird. That's very confusing. Okay, so uh, let's try a question for Chilem. This one. Okay, so Chilam, one yep. of the questions that came in was about the post office. Now, obviously, you, you don't work for the post office. You work with the post office, and we don't have anybody from the post office here, as far as I know. But the question was that during COVID, the post office stopped delivery to some districts. So mm -hmm. I guess the question is, to what extent could the private sector fill the gap? And to what extent did the private sector fill the gap? And whether there is something that could have been done to, to enable or facilitate you filling the gap. Yeah, OK. So uh, I need to answer this in uh, just the uh, uh, operational aspect or uh, uh, including something related to privacy uh, data. It's entirely up to you. Uh, I think okay. it, to me, it's more interesting if you at least make some reference to access to government data and some reference to privacy if they are relevant. But it's up to okay. you. Got it. Because we have we have PCPD Eric here who can always comment on the privacy aspects. But it's it's really up to you what you would like what points you would like to make. Okay, got it. So you don't need to answer it right now, but I think yeah, that's right. that's okay. one of the questions which <clears throat> certainly I will ask you. So and actually uh, during the uh, COVID-19 and the uh, service of uh, post office was suspended in uh, several weeks. And actually uh, Spaceship is a uh, logistic aggregator which aggregate all the logistic solutions in our platform. So we can allocate the uh, logistic resources to the public easily because we know that which uh, private sector of the logistic provider still uh, in service and still in service what district. And actually, uh, we are very close collaborating with those private uh, sector of the logistics service provider. And they have their own um, COVID-19 uh, news from their uh, organization. So uh, actually, we, we understand they can handle the door-to-door -door service or just um, able to service the delivery uh, at the uh, building downstairs or, uh, or what. So we will co 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 collect this kind of data and including the news from uh, 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 um, government. And finally, we can uh, publish a, a new uh, expectation service scope to our clients so that we can still serve uh, our public client in this period with their expectations uh, service level. Um, okay, so so another another thing would be nice to reference would be to what extent did you make use of the government's um, at, uh, own presentation of where the infections were? So so I think one of the other questions is mm -hmm. that will be answered by uh, Donald and Danny is about the 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 hot, the, the government's uh, app right to enable people mm -hmm. to see where the infections were. So yep. was this something that you were able to use or integrate or are the, are the data flow issues about that? So that would be another sort of interesting element, I think, to your answer. Yeah, actually, it is good for us. But uh, uh, in fact, we didn't, uh, um, we didn't uh, uh, use those kind of data at this moment because uh, it's quite uh, urgent uh, situations. And actually, we didn't got that time to build this kind of uh, 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 department for serving our client. But uh, after we know that this data is from uh, government and it's good use for the startup, we will definitely uh, 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 make use of this kind of data to facilitate the coming uh, uh, service level to to facilitate our client to understand which district is embedded and protecting the delivery of oh. uh, Korea. So, so, so again, I guess the question would be whether 
whether the issue was that the APIs were not sufficient or that the data wasn't sufficient or just simply a matter of time? Oh, got it. Um... Again, you don't need to answer me right now. I'm just trying to prompt you as to, you know, the sorts of things that you could make reference to. Okay, in our development team, uh, we know that uh, there is some uh, data from uh, government, but actually the API is not well, uh, uh, what mean, uh, it, which is uh, not, not facilitated to our uh, integrations. Uh, because we need the very flexible integrations and uh, uh Chilem, actually uh, um we're going to start in two minutes and we now have uh 65 participants yeah. so could you prepare yeah to answer the question like uh around uh, three o'clock and stay with us yeah, so I'm, I, this yeah. is just really to warm you up a little bit yeah so that mm -hmm. when we come back to that later okay mm -hmm. maybe we can yeah, get it and, right uh, i get all the information for 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 the sessions yeah. coming. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you. So John, just to recap, uh, I will put the link of the video right before you play that. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to double check, we are recording now. Yeah, we're already recording. You want me to keep this on uh, as a share, or you want me to, to pass it back to you for now? Uh, no, 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 keep it. Okay, we have 75 participants now. And we can start. Okay, I'm just closing down a few things. Okay, welcome everyone to our third uh, Open Data Initiative Conference. I'm very happy to have so many people here. We have close to 300 people registered overall for our four sessions, and I see we have uh, 80 people here today. Um, because of the virus, we're doing this entirely virtual, and we have pre-recorded as far as possible the video. So if you're having any difficulty in your Zoom connection, uh, most of the presentations are will be available in, in, in YouTube and just will be posting the links so that you can play them in YouTube yourself if you have a problem. And we are recording this session so that when it comes to Q&A, we will put up a video of the Q&A so you'll be able to re-watch that again if either you have a connection problem or for some other reason you have to leave before we get to the interesting part. So I'm very grateful 
uh, to all our panelists today. So in particular, we're gonna have a thematic talk from Professor Eric Schuldenfrey from the Department of Architecture in Hong Kong U. We're gonna have a keynote in a moment from Mr. Victor Lam, uh, the Chief Information Officer of the Office of Government um, Information. And we're gonna have uh, a number of panelists. We've got Mr. Eric Che from the Privacy Commissioner's Office. We've got Mr. Danny Young, from the Lands Department. We've got Mr. Donald Mack from OGCIO. We've got Eric from Architecture, I already mentioned, and we've got Mr. Chi Lam Lam, who's the co-founder and CEO at Spaceship, which is a science park incubator. So to get us started, just to give you a little bit of context. So we originally in Hong Kong, you had some funding from ITC, from their general support program, that's how we were able to run the first conference. This time we have got some uh, sponsors who very generously donated resources to enable us to run this conference. And I think you should have all received an email from Just which has the sponsorship messages from our sponsors for whom we're very grateful. So I'm not gonna go through those. You can read the email if you want more details. Um, and we may also be sending out a little bit more information on behalf of the sponsors. Uh, so we won't be passing on your personal data to them, but we may share information on their behalf. So I'm close to retirement from Hong Kong U, but I, open data is one of the things I feel very strongly about. Uh, if you have watched my video, my somewhat controversial video, amongst the background videos, you will understand my perspective. I think open data is, is one particular way in which we can deal with sharing government data, but it's not necessarily the only way. And indeed, we're gonna talk about sharing of government data in many different ways and from many different contexts uh, across these panels. So today's panel is about privacy safe ways to deal with shared data on virus notification, and the specific open data issue is gonna be about building identification, building IDs. But before we get on to the uh, thematic talk and a panel discussion, we're first gonna play the keynote speech from Mr. Victor Lam of OGCIO. So let's check that I can do the screen sharing correctly. So uh, just is going to share the, let's make sure I'm sharing the right thing. So I want to, yeah, I want to share this. So we're going to play. Uh, Dave and Sean, fellow speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm delighted to participate again in the Open Data Conference this year. We have indeed undergone significant changes since the last conference in October 2019. If 2020 went down in history as the year of COVID-19 pandemic, it also marked the rapid transformation of how people adopt innovation and technology to cope with the new normal arising from the pandemic. The application of open data during the pandemic, for instance, has been serving as a practical use case to illustrate how open data can create value for our society. It has been more than a year since the global outbreak of COVID-19. As of today, more than 120 million people were infected with the virus worldwide. The pandemic has changed people's daily lives drastically with social distancing, work from home, compulsory quarantine, travel restrictions, school closure, and even city lockdown becoming the new normal. Notwithstanding all of these, open data stands out as a useful tool to keep the public informed of the latest epidemic situation. In Hong Kong, over 4,000 data sets have been opened up via the public safety information portal for free public use. During the pandemic, 
open data has been leveraged innovatively to create applications to help fight against COVID-19. I will elaborate with a few examples. To keep the public aware of the latest situation of COVID-19, apart from disseminating information through traditional means like media briefings and thematic websites, the government has opened up 23 related data sets and application programming databases so that the public and the industry can make use of them to develop new applications and services. These open data sets include useful data like details of probable and confirmed cases, buildings with cases in the past 14 days, collection forms for submission of specimens for COVID-19 testing, and details of quarantine centers and designated quarantine hotels, just to name a few. Through the collaborative effort among different government departments and the local IT industry, such data were utilized for the prompt development of a COVID-19 interactive map dashboard even within a few days in early 2020 to provide an intuitive interface for disseminating information of COVID-19 infection situation for Hong Kong in a handy manner. Since its launch, the dashboard has attracted more than 48 million views, and it serves as a good example to illustrate how open data can be used in promoting transparency and data sharing to join efforts in fighting against the outbreak of a new unknown disease. These useful open data sets have also opened up opportunities for industry players to create websites and innovative applications to keep the public informed of the latest COVID-19 situation. Another example I would like to talk about is crowd management. To help enforce social distancing, the government made use of technology and open data to implement IT solutions for crowd management in this year's Lunar New Year fairs. Apart from sensors for measuring body temperature, sensors for counting the number of people were also installed to facilitate crowd control. Based on the number of people on the spot, indicators similar to traffic lights were displayed at the entrances of 15 venues of Lunar New Year fairs. People visiting the fairs were required to reserve a ticket at the entrance or through a mobile app before entering the venues when the fairs were crowded. To facilitate easy reference by the public, all these crowd management data were released as open data. And a map-based dashboard was put on the government website during the fair opening period, so that members of the public could plan their visits taking account of the crowdless conditions at different venues. Apart from contributing to the fight against COVID-19, Open data can also be conducive to other areas of smart city development. One notable area is smart mobility. The time of arrival data of public transportation, such as those of buses and MTR trains, are very useful open data for developing new innovative applications to facilitate citizens to commute around the city. In support of the government open data policy, the New World First Bus, City Bus, New Land Car Bus, and the MPR Corporation have opened up the estimated time of arrival or ETA data of their buses and trains since August 2019. Shortly after the opening up of these data, the Transport Department, as well as other commercial app developers, have made use of them to enhance their mobile apps to provide such EPA information to the public. The Office of the Government Chief Information Officer has also developed a city dashboard on traffic and transport to feature the EPA data together with other information like parking vacancies of car parks, traffic flow status on major routes and cross harbor tunnels, or easy reference by the public. 
Even more encouraging is that in addition to the three franchise bus companies and MPLC, ETA data of more public transportations will be published progressively this year, which include the KMB, the Long Green Bus, and 70 Green Minibus lines. MTLC is also planning to open up the EDA data of more lines. With all of these EDA data made available as open data, the government and the industry can make good use of them for developing more smart mobility applications. Spatial data is another type of useful data for smart city development. Since December 2020, the Lens Department has opened up its map data via the map application programming interfaces. Being one of the four quick means projects under the common spatial data infrastructure, the Map API is a web mapping service to support applications requiring map display. In line with the Smart City Initiative of promoting mobility and connectivity, the 3D pedestrian network and the 3D visualization map data sets have also been opened up to support navigation services to meet the special needs of people with physical disabilities. This year, the last department will continue opening up more digital map data, including those 1 to 20,000, 1 to 10,000, 1 to 5,000, and even 1 to 1,000 mean scale topographic maps. All of these will be useful ingredients for developing more smart city applications. Open data and fuel economic growth and bring about numerous societal benefits. It can serve as useful data for smart city development as well as for combating the epidemic. Since the implementation of our open data policy in October 2018, we have seen notable progress with active participation by government departments, public and private organizations. The government has also set a good example in making use of open data to develop innovative services like the COVID-19 interactive map dashboard and the smart city dashboards. We are also grateful that open data like the EPA data are well received by the public and the industry. With more and more map data and spatial data opening up in the foreseeable future, I believe the power of open data will be further unmatched. And let's work together to fully unlock its potential. Last but not least, even though this year's event has to be conducted online due to social distancing, I'm sure that the event can still serve as an excellent platform to exchange views on open data development. I look forward to seeing you all face to face again next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Victor, for that presentation. I think there are some very positive elements in his presentation that we can see. Uh, Welcome to just Alexa. a minute. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. Folks, I need to stop you know, my. I've got such a pep in my step. I don't know about you, but I... right? So the some very exciting uh, things moving forward in terms of the private sector data, government regulated data, as well as data from the government itself. So I think those are all very positive things for us to look forward to. So, young again. Go away. Because Russia and America are back to being. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is we're going to switch to Professor uh, Hong Kong Yu, Eric, Professor Shulgum Frey's thematic talk about spatial contact tracing, so that you can have some idea about what the issues are. Eric is with us, but we're going to have the the video on uh, shown live here, and also just is going to share the playlist so that you can play it directly on YouTube if you're having any difficulties with the connection. So let me just get back to my uh, big and Sean. playlist. Hello, speakers. So let me get my playlist ready. Okay, so now I'm going to, to play the video 
from Hong Kong U Eric. We have to make a distinction. We have a Hong Kong U Eric and a PCP Eric. So this is our Hong Kong U Eric professor's presentation on spatial contact tracing. Let me switch back to share again. Thank you for having me today. This is a system I'm developing together with many colleagues here at Hong Kong U. Sorry, the just a moment. To keep the... Let me just get my switch back. Here we go. I'll make sure I share the right thing. Have I shared the right thing? Yes. Yes, I have. Okay. So let me just go back to full screen. Take it back to the beginning and then off we go. Thank you for having me today. This is a system I'm developing together with many colleagues here at Hong Kong U. The idea is to keep the COVID-19 pandemic from overwhelming the healthcare systems. Half the world remained at home. However, the world cannot remain at home forever. The economic costs are simply too high. To prevent a future epidemic wave from growing exponentially, Manual contact tracing will not work. It is simply too slow. Contact tracing needs to be instantaneous because the number of transmissions per day significantly increases after day two. Google and Apple privacy preserving contact tracing is instantaneous, but it uses the Bluetooth receive signal strength indicator, the RSSI value, to determine the distance for the exposure risk level. RSSI measurements are not a reliable way to calculate distances because they fluctuate greatly under different conditions. And this uncertainty is inherent to all wireless signals. Although transmission risk for COVID-19 is commonly measured in terms of distances, for instance, to remain two meters apart, it is difficult to determine the two phones pictured below are two meters apart or eight meters. Therefore, Google and Apple contact tracing lacks the necessary spatial context required to calculate the exposure risk level accurately, potentially leading to many missed detections. Outdoors, where the risk of transmission from COVID-19 is less, Bluetooth RSSI values make people appear much closer than they are because there are fewer obstacles and fewer bodies to absorb the radio signal. Indoors, where the tr transmission risk from COVID-19 is greater, Bluetooth RSSI values make people appear further apart because furniture and people's bodies absorb the radio signals. Adding a static Bluetooth device, which participates in Google and Apple contact tracing, to a room allows for spatial contact tracing. Mounted on the ceiling of the room, the device will receive the RSSI value more clearly. Additionally, people who attend an event but do not have the app installed can be notified by the spatial contact tracing system. Data collected through the spatial contact tracing could also be used by epidemiologists for redefining transmission models and hence refine both the conditions that trigger contact tracing user alerts and how severe those alerts actually are. A building with multiple static devices and a manager who has a comprehensive view of the severity a contact between positive testing and traces in the building could send different levels of warning. For example, one notification for recipients within the same room as a positive testing user, another notification for recipients occupying the same floor, and a third notification for recipients occupying the same building. Alerted contacts could then decide on their relevant level of response to take, which is essentially pertinent to those with pre-existing health conditions or for contacts with, with or frequently visit individuals at higher risk. Spatial contact tracing will significantly increase the number of people notified instantly when a COVID-19 case is confirmed. In the diagram of trace contacts below, each icon represents one case in Singapore. A cluster of cases often occurred at a single location, such as the preschool in the figure below. But when a sudden exponential rise in cases overwhelmed the people manually tracing the contacts, they could no longer identify all the contacts within the crucial two-day window, and details of the cases were not recorded. Hundreds of cases were then not adequately traced. The Google and Apple system only traces device to device, phone to phone proximity, and will therefore have a limited impact. Spatial contact tracing maintains location and identity privacy of the app users while adding spatial and temporal awareness to the system. 
Following Google and Apple specifications, the low cost US $25 spatial contacting tracing device inherits the security and privacy features of Google and Apple contact tracing system. Since only the managers of the spaces with these devices have knowledge of the device's locations, the spatial contact tracing system is decentralized and privacy preserving. For users who do not own a mobile device, using a US $12 Bluetooth beacon with ephemeral identifiers, which is a unique rolling ID system that helps preserve privacy, allows such user users to receive exposure notifications. These users could then choose when and where to carry the beacon, further preserving their privacy. Spatial contact tracing significantly extends the effectiveness of the Google and Apple contact tracing system through low cost devices, protecting billions of people, whether or not they have an Apple or Android mobile phone. Similar to visual fire systems that are required in public buildings, these are systems that are installed for the very few instances that will eventually save lives. In the space of the past two decades, we've seen infectious outbreaks of SARS, H1N1, MERS, Ebola, and now COVID-19. In response to these contemporary crises, four of which played out in modern cities where with modern technology, we ask, how should cities be defended against infectious disease? Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. I've got a... So, um, let me just stop the share. So one of the things I forgot to mention before that uh, presentation is that if you have additional questions beyond the ones you've already submitted, uh, you're welcome to submit them via Zoom chat. You can submit them directly to just, so if you search for Hong Kong U amongst the participants, you'll see there are three of us, me, uh, Eric, and Just Kang. You can submit direct to Just. If you have any questions, you don't have to uh, make them public. You can submit them directly to her. And then after the panelist presentation, we're going to have a Q&A where we're going to select some of the questions we've already received and any other interesting questions which are submitted during the videos. Uh, so feel, feel free to submit them. Again, I encourage you to send them directly to Just so you don't disturb everyone else. And that way you don't have to, to identify yourself. We're not going to identify who, who asked any of the questions. Okay, these are all going to be answered uh, separately. So uh, we now have presentations from our panel members. So I'm now going to play this, uh, another playlist from the, of the videos from the panelists. I will stop briefly between each of them. Again, if you have any questions, please send them direct to just in chat. And if you're having difficulty watching the videos in Zoom, again, Just is going to share with you the, uh, the playlist link so that you can directly uh, watch the videos. So I'm now going to switch to the panel one. So the first talk in our sequence is from Donald Mack who is the Assistant Government Chief Information Officer in OGCIO. So let me just turn my sharing back on again. Where are we? There we go. And switch to full screen. And off we go. Professor John Bacon Straw, uh, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to join you all here today in this panel to share about how government adopted privacy safe ways to provide virus notification to help contain the spreading of COVID 19. Since the outbreak of the COVID 19, the government has tapped on technology for effective implementations of various public health measures like quarantine arrangement, large scale COVID-19 testing, booking for vaccination and providing virus notifications. Today, I would like to talk about, about the virus notifications. Let's start with the objective. By implementing the uh, 
virus notification app, we aim to encourage the public to keep a precise record of their whereabouts. Uh, in case one is contracted with the COVID-19, this whereabout information will be very useful for further investigation and contact tracing work. And we would like to also use this app to notify public members of possible risks of contact with persons infected with the COVID-19 and provide appropriate health advice. In this way, we can help reduce the risk of further transmission of the virus. Let's start with the design principles uh, about the app. Uh, one of the, the very first uh, principle is that the, the, only the public members can uh, uh, will keep the record of their whereabouts by themselves in their mobile device locally. That means that no other person and or the central system can access their whereabouts information. And also no user registration is required, meaning that the personal profile are not necessary for registration to use the app. There's no GPS tracking. As I've said before, no access to the user's whereabouts information by the central system. The uh, visit records are all encrypted on the mobile phones and erased automatically after 31 days. And, and the app will only collect information on values and transportation having confirmed the cases from the sensor system for matching it locally. Uh, such that it can provide the virus notification analysis there. So, uh, some information about the Vivo Safe app. It was launched in the uh, November 16 last year. It is previously by design, and the main objective is that uh, the public can record their whereabouts by themselves by scanning a QR code of the venues or the taxi registration map, and it is. The app is a uh, value centric and it is all on voluntary participations. So, how do the Leafhome Safe app works? First of all, the participating values will need to do a registration and then they can get a, a, a QR code and then they print it and post it up on their values. For the visitors, when, when, they, uh, uh, when they visit the values, they can use the app to, to scan the QR code to record their visit. In case they are contracted with the COVID-19, they can use the app to report uh, confirmed the positive cases uh, with their consent. And on the other hand, for the other users, they can uh, download the, uh, the list of uh, uh, venues and transportation of confirmed cases uh, from time to time to the app and then generate the uh, uh, exposure notifications in, within the app. So how the virus notification works? First of all, uh, when there's a person confirmed with uh, 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 COVID-19, uh, the uh, Center of the Health Protection of the CHP will do a interview with them to uh, try to identify the list of venues or transportation they have taken within the last uh, 14 days. If the users, if, if the patients has also used the uh, Leave Home Safe app, the the, the visit records will be also be uploaded to CHP under their consent. With all these, the CHP can generate a list of venues visited and transportation taken by the patients. And this information will also be opened up in the open data portal. And with this information, the Leafon Safe app backend can download a list of uh, venues visited and transportation taken from the open data portal. A, and also, if uh, the patients have uh, the Leave Home Safe app, the list of values visited by him and or, or transportation taken by him will also be sent to the Leave Home Safe back end. All these will be mapped to the Leave Home Safe value list or uh, uh, transportation identifier so that uh, the, when the Leave Home Safe app users download these information, periodically from the back end to check against the record and then the leave home safe uh, virus notifications can be generated. And I will also, also, I would like to take, the, take this opportunity to uh, talk about the uh, Google and Apple exposure notification rate framework, which, is, uh, which was launched on the April 10th last year. It, the Google and Apple framework was based on the uh, Bluetooth technology on mobile devices. In other words, uh, 
the, the concept is that uh, whenever there are two mobile phones coming close to each other for a certain period of time, the, the they will exchange a kind of like VLE beacon and then record such a, a, a contact within their mobile phone. Uh, but the characteristic of this framework is that no one, even the owner of the phone, can do the list. And this is the way how Google and Apple treats uh, privacy. And also the whereabout of context was not uh, recorded. Let's illustrate it by a, an example. For example, Alice and Bob are uh, match up each other uh, at the park and they have a lengthy conversations. And, and during this time, if they both install with the Google and Apple framework, they're formally exchange beacon through Bluetooth and then the, the, they will have a record about this uh, contact. For example, let's say a few days later, uh, Bob was uh, confirmed positive. Then under his Bob's consent, uh, he can upload the, uh, the record of his last uh, contact list uh, to the Google and Apple servers. In the meantime, when uh, uh, Alice uh, phone download the uh, list from the uh, Apple and Google server from time to time, and he can, she can see that there's a match found, and then uh, she can subsequently receive a notification on, on that is a possibility that she has come into close contact with a person contracted with uh, COVID-19, but she will never know that where and, and when uh, such contacts have taken place. So let's take some time to compare the differences between the, the two apps. For the Leaf Home Safe app, the notification is based on value visited and transportation taken, uh, while the Google Apple framework is based on people contact. And as uh, the Leaf Home Safe app is value uh, centric, so it is possible to send alert based on some hotspot. But uh, the Google Apple framework cannot do so because they are basically uh, based on the Bluetooth uh, detection of these uh, someone installing the same framework. Uh, they never know that uh, where this contact was made. And also the Leaf Home Safe app can uh, generate notification independent of the uptake rate, uh, because as you can see that the, whenever uh, there are some hotspot identified by the, the CHP, they can send a list of values to the app users so that they can the app can compare with the uh, visit record of themselves and then, and then make the appropriate virus notifications. But for the Google Apple framework, the uptake rate is very important for generation of such kind of alert. And also the uh, Leaf Home Safe uh, can facilitate users to record their whereabouts for which will facilitate further investigations and contact tracing work in case they are confirmed to be infected. But for the Google Apple framework, no such information or whereabouts can be recorded to facilitate further investigations. So, uh, the conclusion is that the government is committed to protect, protect privacy of individuals. Mm -hmm. Before the app is privacy by design uh, to provide rights of notification without compromising individuals' personal privacy. We will undergo continuous improvement to enhance the user experience of the app and acceptability and uh, uptake rate are always critical for this kind of app, including both the phone safe and the app and Google framework. So I would like to appeal to all participants of this panel and as well as the audience to download the Leaf Home Save app and then and help to protect Hong Kong together. Thank you. Okay, thank you very Good much. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Eric Sam, we have, So our next talk uh, is from our panelist from PCPD, Eric J who's going to talk about balancing protection of personal data privacy and public health in the pandemic. Let me resume my share and take you back to the beginning. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Say, Assistant Privacy Commissioner for Personal Data Public Affairs. This afternoon, I'm going to share with you two very important issues arising from the COVID-19 pandemic from the personal data privacy perspective. One relates to contact tracing apps 
And the other one relates to the disclosure of information in relation to COVID-19 confirmed cases. I hope this short presentation can form part of the basis for our discussion later this afternoon. As regards contact tracing apps, our office, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Personal Data, conducted a survey of 32 jurisdictions back in August and September last year. We found that contact tracing apps are widely adopted across the world as a measure to control the spread of COVID-19. In our survey, we found that digital technology was deployed in 84% of jurisdictions for the purposes of contact tracing. And within these jurisdictions, a majority of them, which was 72%, actually use contact tracing apps. And the use of almost all contact, tra contact tracing apps was voluntary. From the survey, we have identified some common privacy protection best practices for contact tracing apps, which I will share with you. Number one is the conduct of a privacy impact assessment before rolling out the apps to ensure that the apps comply with the principle of privacy by design. Another best practice is the permission of the voluntary use of the apps by the users. <clears throat> Minimization of data collection is another best practice, for example, by requiring no registration before use, collecting only anonymous contact data, and storing the contact data only on users' mobile phones, which is a decentralized approach for storage. And the maximization of transparency and enhancement of public trust by publishing privacy policies of the apps and disclosing data retention policies. Here in Hong Kong, as many of you know, the government launched the contact tracing app called Leave Home Safe in November 2020. We understand that the government has engaged an independent third party to conduct an assessment of the privacy impact of the Leave Home Safe app to ensure its compliance with the requirements of the Personal Data Privacy Ordinance, which is the privacy protection law here in Hong Kong. Having examined the key features of the Leave Home Safe app from the personal data privacy perspective, we consider that the app is generally in line with the best practices being advocated internationally for the following, following reasons. First of all, the app does not collect users' GPS data or track the users' movements or locations. The app does not require any registration either before use or collect any personal data during the process of download. Visits records are stored on the user's mobile phones only. That is, again, a decentralized approach. And the data, the visit records, will be erased automatically after 31 days. And only the infected persons may be required under the relevant public health protection law to upload their visit records for contact tracing. Moving on, I'm going to talk about the disclosure of information in relation to confirmed cases of COVID-19. Regarding COVID-19 confirmed cases, we noted from the government that it has been publishing relevant information online by ways of, for example, um, an interactive map and documents in PDF format. The information being disclosed includes the age and gender of the infected persons and the buildings in which they reside. No names of the infected persons are disclosed. No complete addresses are disclosed either. Um, in principle, um, as I'm sure you will agree, disclosure can enhance transparency and in turn facilitate precautionary measures to protect public health. 
Um, but one has to be mindful about whether the degree or extent of disclosure is necessary or justified. Um, we believe that when disclosing the information about the infected persons, a reasonable balance has to be struck between the privacy rights of the persons and the public health. Disclosing too much information may lead to re-identification of the persons infected. And this only this not only infringes public, uh, sorry, this not only infringes privacy rights. Um, but may also lead to stigmatization of the persons and their family members. However, disclosing too little information may not be very helpful for the public to take their precautionary actions. Currently, the addresses of the infected persons are disclosed down to the building level only. Um, the PCPD considers this a reasonable balance because, on the one hand, it is difficult to re-identify the infected persons by using the names of the buildings, since, as you all know, many buildings, sorry, many people in Hong Kong live in multi-story buildings, most of which are high-rises with dozens and hundreds of units and households. But on the other, but on the other hand, the information will the information being disclosed will enable the residents or visitors of the relevant buildings to take precautionary measures that they believe or they consider necessary. So in closing, in this time of the pandemic, um, let us all stay safe, protect public health and safeguard personal data privacy at the same time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... PCPD Eric, and then and then our next presentation is by Danny Young from the Lands Department. Oops, I accidentally stopped my sharing instead of restarting it. Let me just restart that again. Okay, so his presentation is about the sharing of spatial data on COVID-19. Good afternoon, Professor Peter Song, fellow panelists, and all who joined this conference. Thank you for having me today to tell you more about the work of the Lens Department on sharing of spatial data on COVID-19. When I first received the agenda of this conference, it really caught my eyes on this entire topic. This topic is exactly telling the story from what part I went through in the past year when the work of the COVID-19 dashboard to support the government to provide the latest situation of COVID-19 to the public. First of all, let me introduce the COVID-19 dashboard to you. When we were experiencing the first COVID-19 outbreak early last year, the government was raising to make the latest COVID information available to the public, to help fighting the virus together and soothing the anxieties of the community with greater transparency of the pandemic information. In views of the urgency at that time, our department has worked with the Development Bureau to develop an interactive map dashboard for the Center for Health Protection, CHP. And we successfully launched the dashboard to the public in February last year. One of the main features of the COVID-19 dashboard is to show locations of the COVID-19 cases on the map, allowing the public to know where the common cases are. And we have shared this confirmed case of data set on our children's store field chart. User can download the whole data set or only the confirmed cases in the past 14 days. To show the locations of the confirmed cases on demand, we need to convert the test code addresses published in the CHP website to spatial data using some type of geographic services, such as location search API from our department. I just look up service API from Asia or geotaking the location of the map manually. Each service has its pros and cons, and they all provide a key capacity to sharing of location of the common case. Which service to use really depends on the purpose of the application that use the geocorporate locations. Now, let me introduce two identifiers that could be used for virus replication. 
The first one that I would like to introduce is Jewel Address. Jewel Address is a group of 19 teachers. It is decided as a team to match actual addresses of different descriptions to facilitate effective sharing of address information. Since the group contains coordinates information, we can use it to locate an address on the map very quickly. But I want to emphasize that two address is an identifier to linking address record, not buildings. Take a look at these two examples, North Pond Government Primary School and Cyberport Cyber Free, which involves multiple buildings in their locations. In these two cases, two address cannot precisely tell us which building a confirmed case belongs. Two address is only good for sharing of address based data. Now, let me introduce another identifier called Building Social ID to you. It is a unique building identifier to facilitate the exchange of building data among government departments. The structure of building social ID is the same as the two address. The only difference is that building social ID is an identifier associated with an individual building, not an uh, address. Then you may ask, can I use building social ID as a common key for sharing of virus information? The answer I would say is yes or no. You can use it in most of the cases that relate to a building. Let's take a look at these two real examples of COVID-19 cases. The construction site of Zhang Fan Road, Nan Chin Tung, and the soccer pitch at Moss Park do not have building structure. In these two examples, you will not be able to provide building society for locating the cases on the map. Instead, we manually geotag the location on the map. Besides, we may not provide building society to some buildings with confirmed the cases. For example, buildings of individual bungalows or village type of houses. To protect the privacy of the individual confirmed cases who live in standalone bungalows or village type houses, this building will not be geocoded or shown on the map. In other words, the building social ID will not be provided for those cases. In order to show this type of confirmed cases on the map, we normally adopt the grid coordinate of the core corresponding villages or roads to represent the cases. In short, different types of unique identifiers serve different purposes of different applications. Lensby and other government departments have long been using building social ID to exchange building data. It might not fit well with all the cases when it comes to applications such as virus applications. However, the concept of using the coordinate component as part of the unique identifier could be applicable to the exchange of location data or virus location. And this is what I want to share with you this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Chia and Kobana. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for Danny for that presentation. Um, and we can ask him some questions about that later. And our final panelist is going to talk about uh, the private sector startup perspective, talking about operation efficiencies in the logistic world with open data. So this is Mr. Lam Wan Chi uh, from the startup spaceship. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is GMC and Kobana of Station. Today, I would like to use address identification as an example to showcase how open data can facilitate the operation efficiency in the logistic world. Since our service launched in November 2019, Station has been the leading all in one logistics solutions platform in Hong Kong. Up to now, we have processed an open one for three million online student quotations. We have two create a new era of seamless and effortless fast and easy global shipment experience for everyone. Through the power of data and technology innovations, if you need to ship anything, you can simply go to station, instantly search, compare, and book the shipment you want, just like the logistic version of Chicago. One of the biggest strengths of spatial is that we greatly shorten the time and effort that users need to make when keeping shipment, very different from the traditional Korea practice, 
the greatly speed up six times of the original Shenzhen booking times and simplify everything into just four booking set. User can enjoy all Korean services in one single platform. But to create this fast and easy experience, my team has put a good amount of effort in simplifying step in handling and just info. From our experience, we have identified several common problems repeatedly appear during the address handling. For many Hong Kong people, they are not familiarized with the standard address format. Mostly, they only provide using names without giving other sufficient details like the block number, street number, or district. Also, users frequently fail to provide accurate complete addresses. We already did that type of mistake and misspelling in a lengthy address. For people with a relatively low English accuracy rate, including an address in English would be a very difficult task for them. The above address issue turned out to be one of the major causes for unsuccessful students, and our team is also searching for solutions. For our staff, this is also quite time consuming for us to communicate with the lengthy address back and forth internally. And imagine we are managing over 40 careers on the same platform. With no easy address identification practice, the communications can be very costly. The outbreak of COVID-19 further complicate our logistic practice. We need to timely update on the list of buildings with confirmed cases of COVID-19, in which this highly affected our door-to-door -door pickup and delivery service can still support the affected area. Also, once they are reported cases of the locally transmitted COVID-19 cases for the logistics staff, there is a huge need to properly check and trace the daily route of the staff. In case the staff is tested positive for the open, we can immediately take actions to hear report the responsible department. It's quite difficult for a young startup to tackle the above non existing address issue at known. Currently, our team is studying the address lockdown and GEO address no data set by the offices of the government chief information officer to see how can we add that this to our system to help our user easily search and refine their address. We have a high hope that we can make a good use of this data of open data set and advance the address conditions process. While preparing for this story, we heard of another idea called Unique Building ID, which could be an even more advancing feature to the local functions. With a very simple ID for just say a feature code consists of number and alphabet, just like it's simple. Anyone can easily and precisely describe the locations and minimize the possibility of making mistakes in our daily operations. As part of industry insider, we help to facilitate the development phase of the traditional logistic field. We very much look forward to the implementation of the address open data set. And if the unit building ID would be soon launched as a few features, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lam. But let me exit YouTube before we start watching things we don't want to watch. Okay. So I think you've got some very interesting presentations from our panelists. Uh, I'm just, I've got a few questions here to get us started. Again, if you have new questions, please uh, send them by email or chat, uh, Zoom chat to Just, and then she will pass them on to me. So the first question I wanted to ask with was somebody asked that said that the geo address lookup scheme looks great is it available now for public use? So I don't know whether Donald or Danny wants to, to respond to that. Uh, I, I'm Donald. Uh, perhaps I, I can I can answer this uh, in, a, in a in a concise way. Yes, the geo address has already been opened up in the open data portal, government's open data portal. The it is uh, the URL is data.geo.k. And you can actually, when you get into the portal, you can do a search uh, on the uh, the uh, address lookup service. Then the service itself will, uh, apart from the, all those textual address information, there's another another piece of data called the geo address attached to each address. So I will appeal to all to make good use of this information. This uh, the currently the geo address has. Uh, we have been uh, gradually building up the, the full set of your address for Hong Kong. And uh, currently there are over uh, 100,000 already, uh, which I would say it covers around the, the uh, 
more than more than half already. And in terms of coverage, it already covers basically uh, around 99% of public housing estate as well as 95% of residential buildings. Uh, not, not to say uh, it also covers uh, 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 address like the library and public hospital as well. So, so, uh, so when's your expectation that you would reach essentially, you know, coverage of nearly everything? Uh, our target is uh, perhaps maybe Danny can can further stop but our target is to complete the the uh, the mapping of these all these your address within this year. Okay. Perhaps yeah, maybe Danny can supplement. Yes, uh, this is Danny. Yes, um, yeah. The geo address project is led by OGO in collaboration with uh, RVD and our lens department. And uh, the project is, is expected to be completed by October this year. So by that time, we expected to have like more than, uh, I would say 170,000 addresses associated with the geo address. So- Can I ask you to, to explain a little bit, you, you talked very briefly in your presentation about the difference between the building ID and the geo address. And you said they were similar. So can you explain a little bit? So for example, if I have multiple buildings vertically dispersed, but at the same uh, geolocation, how do you distinguish those in, in, the, in the building ID system? Okay, well, the format of the building says UID is the same as the uh, geo address. Uh, but the only difference is that um, when you have, as I mentioned in my presentation, when there are multiple buildings, there's only one address and there's only one geo address as well. Right. Um, so how can we distinguish it? Uh, you have to look at the, the sequence of the, the format of the geo code. Uh, it's a con it consists of a 19 digit. The first 10 digits is about the geographic location. And then the, the 11th digit is about the type of the building. If it is a P, it represents a podium. If it's a T, it represents a, a tower. So in your cases, if a, if a tower on top of a podium, you can basically basically distinguish this by looking at the geo address code of that. Uh, so your example of Pacific Place right. would be that you've got the podium, which is the shopping area, and then the tower on top, which is say the hotels or the offices. If, have I understood it correctly? Yes, correct. Right. And also the last um, eight digit is the creation date of the record. So right. just, just in case if a building demolished that we still can keep track of this building. Okay, that, that's very helpful. So somebody also asked then, other than buildings themselves, so that, can the geo address be extended to cover pathways? Or in fact, the examples I think that one of you gave about a sports field, right? Is it possible to extend the geo address concept to cover pathways and fields? Uh, oh, oh, okay, let me say, uh, well, when we are talking about walking path, I, I really need to mention one of our latest open data set called the 3D pedestrian network. As mentioned, that, or as also mentioned in uh, Victor Keylock's speech earlier. Right. This data set was designed to support pedestrian navigation. And, uh, and, and we have already released it to the public last year. Uh, so I think that all the great ingredients like, like the uh, address lookup service, the geo address and the 3D pedestrian network are already there. I think we just need to combine them to make them work together. So, so does that mean there, there are identifiers for each of the pathways in the, in the pedestrian network that we could use? Yeah, you can just use the coordinates. And also like, uh, it depends on, you can like use the address, the coordinate or uh, use the um, the search API from our department to use it. So what about the example of the sports field? I think came up right in the sense that there had been COVID cases linked to say a, a sports field. Is that, can that also be in some way is there again some identifier that we can use other than just the general spatial coordinates? Um, in, well, we can use some, uh, I, I believe the, 
the uh, uh, Lipum Safe have a specific code for those kind of things too. So but is it possible that there will be a, a public API so that, so for example, if, if so, so let me just give you an example of a Hong Kong U project that we did in the past, which was about playgrounds, right? Playgrounds, we wanted to, to make it accessible that people could find playgrounds with specific uh, capability for different types of children. So in that sort of situation, is there a public API that would enable us to, to match playgrounds, not just ones managed by government, but ones from the private sector? Yeah, we have the, um, well, we are going to release um, um, some map data, digital topographic map data, which include like the building, the, some site, in the site uh, data set, you can find the playground in that data set. So, so, but we're not yet at the stage where there is a, for example, a set of unique identifiers for those playgrounds. No, not yet. You have to do it on a spatial basis. Right, okay. right. So that's yeah. something maybe for the future. Okay, yeah. so a, a very uh, different- Professor, pro, pro, yes. Professor, uh, yes. per, perhaps I can, I can supplement a, a bit about- sure about why we produce this kind of geo address. Yeah. Uh, it is bas basically similar to the concept of a zip code. Yeah. And the, the, the geo address is, is actually quite intuitive in terms of that sense. It maps to a, a kind of a, an address, which is like no all, all ordinary people would make use of. For example, we, we make use of a postal address to, to mail something to others then this address will be mapped to a geo address. The, the concept is kind of a zip code, and, and, but embedded with geo location or, or in terms of the geospatial information on it. So you can I mean, just I think, think about I think this the, way. The issue is that, um, for example, as an end consumer, so, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to Mr. Lam in a minute to talk about the logistic context, but as yeah. a consumer, where I'm having to input my address, say for delivery from the supermarket, it's very tedious to type it in every different uh, logistic context. I have to input my address in a different way. And sometimes it rejects it and says, this is not mm. the right format. And they may deliver it to the wrong location. So I guess the question is, you know, can we expect that this will, the end user who's inputting it, that, that if I understand the code that Danny was talking about sounds rather long to be memorized, right? So would I as an end user actually need to memorize those 18 digits? Or would, for example, the first, I think, was it 10 digits or whatever, which were the geolocation uh, plus the letter be sufficient in practice? So, I, you know, have you thought through about what the, the general public um, interface might be? Yes, uh, I think this, this is a very, very good question in, 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 indeed. And, uh, uh, first of all, we in the uh, open data portal, we have already uh, opened up and corresponding API so that it is uh, actually, I think it is not difficult to make use of this kind of API to build a more intuitive interface. For example, just by typing uh, an address structurally and then retrieve the geo address automatically from the API. In that way, we can expect that the there can be there can be some uh, some kind of commercial application or some handy tools, for example, under the future uh, uh, common spatial uh, data infrastructure program, which but, will. Does that mean you, in effect, you this is an opportunity for the private sector, yes. or is it something that the government is going to do? The government will 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 has already opened up this kind of information through an API already, and so uh, we would. Of course, the government can also build this kind of interface. For example, we can encourage the post office to uh, embed this uh, geo address into the, 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 I understand they have a online uh, a web tools for people to input their address in a structural way so that uh, this can also be added to their tools so that the, the geo address can be automatic, automatically retrieved and then added to, for example, a mailing label. Right. Then in that way, uh, in terms of the postal de delivery, it would be more accurate. And also I think this can be of good use for logistic company like 
Right. So, so you've given me yeah. exactly the right lead time. I'm going to ask Tilan to respond. Yes. So in fact, one of the questions was that during the, the virus, when in the extreme case of the virus, the post office is reduced service for many areas. And in some cases, they even stopped deliveries for some areas. So I guess to what extent can the private sector address this issue in general? And what sort of data would facilitate the private sector doing a better job of this uh, in the future? Chilam, you want to respond? Uh, hello. Um, actually, especially with a logistic aggregator, so that uh, we are aggregating um, close office service and uh, including any other private sector like uh, FedEx, UPS, logistic provider service in our platform so that uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, the post office was suspended their service for several weeks, right? So uh, we still have our uh, private sector logistic service provider. Uh, at this moment, we can easily to allocate the logistic volume to satisfy our client needs uh, uh, for the delivery needs. However, we need to um, confirm the career and actually the uh, uh, COVID um, precaution in, in this moment, uh, we need to gather uh, all the information from our partner, like a service provider. Uh, they already got a, a list of the confirmed cases for a different locations, so that they are no, they are not going to serve in this area. However, uh, in our aspect, we feel that it's not yet a timely update and accurate for us, so that we are trying to serve some data source from our government so that our developer have fun um, Hong Kong Geo data store and we're doing some API connections with uh, this API data source and which is uh, much more uh, precise and uh, timely update for us to netting our career to understand which location was uh, being invited and we are not going to serve in this area. Uh, for our platform, we can directly uh, reflect this uh, uh, in fact, area and not going to be a serve, uh, service uh, uh, area to our client and let them got a very great uh, expectation for the service level. So that in this moment, we still can maintain our service to our client and satisfy their delivery needs in this moment. So presumably when the geo address coverage is essentially full, that this will generally improve the quality of delivery services from everybody, not just the post office, but the private sector. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so let, let me go to a somewhat different topic. So, so this is the issue really about the dashboard and how it can help. So we had a question that said, as an end user, how can I make use of the dashboard to stay safe during COVID? So presumably means both to know whether I'm safe at home or at work. So Danny, would you like to, to illustrate maybe how we can use the, the dashboard for us? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe let me share my screen with you. Um, Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen fine. Thank you. Okay, let me make it larger. Okay, um, this is the dashboard that we have developed for the CHP. Um, to answer that question, uh, I think um, there are two ways of using dashboard to inform user where are the confirmed cases. Uh, I think the most intuitive way is by just by looking at the map, right? And we have already put all the confirmed cases on the map with color. So, and also when you look at the color and you can actually see where are the confirmed cases are. And also we have developed a feature, a search feature. Um, so you can basically, you user can just type in like, I uh, just mean, Basically, user can just uh, type in uh, an, an address or place name, or use its mobile location, or just click on a map, click on a map, and then define your searching radius. In this case, 500 meter, 
you can see 500 meter. And then once you have defined the search criteria, the dashboard will automatically filter out the, or find out all the confirmed cases within that buffer. And you can see at, uh, uh, at the right hand side of the screen, uh, it filter out like that you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cases within 500 meters from the form that I just located. So this is the feature that the dashboard provide to facilitate people to know where the confirmed cases are. Okay. So, so actually what, let me, that leads into a question that we got, which was, there are other websites. In other words, if we, in addition to the government's website, um, there are other websites which are arguably more user-friendly than the one the government did because they can do things much more quickly. So to what extent does the government see as its responsibility to facilitate a citizen website in addition to implementing your own dashboard? So, so what sort of initiatives do you have in future so that if there is another uh, outbreak of, a, of another infected disease, people can create their own uh, dashboards in addition to, to the government one? Uh, Professor, perhaps uh, I'm, I'm Donald, perhaps I can, yeah. I can address this question. Sure. Uh, uh, since the uh, outbreak of the COVID-19, the, the government has actually uh, 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 doing things like we have been opening up uh, various open data sets. In fact, we open up more than 20 open data sets in relation to COVID-19. So uh, actually the, the dashboard as demonstrated by Danny is, is a one of the byproduct of open data. They, 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 they actually make use of these open data to build a dashboard. So can I put, put my finger on you a little bit and say, well, so if I looked at the data behind that dashboard, is any of that data not open data? No. It's they're all, all open data. They're all open data. They're all based on open data. Okay, then and, you and, answered my question. I and answer. actually oh, the right, right. dashboard has not fully utilized all the 20 data sets. Right, right. The okay. I think it's 23 open data sets. Okay. And in fact, uh, I've been approached by a number of app web, uh, web and app developer uh, uh, asking for advice on how to make use of this open data set. And, and we also sent out a data dictionary, the metadata, and also explain the mechanism of, for, for example, the, the, the time of day of each update, of the update of each data set. And, and actually, I, recently, I, I was approached by one of the industry player asking about the same thing because they he wants to develop an app for his own company so that he can uh, timely implement work from home measures for example if there's a a his, his working colleague has been uh, uh living in the same building of an infected person then he may ask the colleague to stay to work from home for sure. a certain period of time so i think this the, this kind of open data set has actually help the public and the industry a lot. Absolutely. So I mean, I think that, well, that's a great example that it's, it's driven by open data. So, so I don't know if there's anybody here from the transport department. I apologize if I'm a little rude, but I mean, the, I, I think the counter example to what you guys have done is the transport department's app on, on mobility, which frankly, in my view, is very poor. It's, it's very unuser friendly uh, compared to say something like City Mapper. I think Gene, who, who was working for City Mapper before, is one of the people here. But I mean, I think City Mapper is a wonderful app, and it saved me during the protest when I couldn't get home from Chun Mun, enabled me to get home, even though many forms of transport were being shut. Whereas the transport department app to me was terrible. So, so the key to me, the key issue is that the more important thing is to facilitate for government to facilitate uh, third way, third sector. NGOs and commercial sector to do things while having, I think the proof of concept is excellent. So I think the dashboard as a proof of concept is wonderful, but making sure that all the data is open so that other people can try and create something better, I think is also important. So I think I think that that's yeah. the framing of it. So I'm very yes. happy that you've said that all of that is is framed around open data. Yes, and, can I, can and, I change and, act, and act, actually this is yeah. the reason why the the government uh, uh, promulgate open data policy back in sure. 2008. So well, I, this I is- mean, I, th I yeah. think saying publicly on the website 
you know, all of the data here is, is open would be very helpful. It, and in the same way, there was, there was one other thing I meant to, to reference earlier. The Leave Home Act in your presentation, if I'm, you talked about the uh, privacy assessment of that. Now, one of the conversations I've had with PCPD previously was that when I went looking, I couldn't find the privacy assessment of the Leave Home Act. In fact, the assessment is very good. And I think we, we saw the PCPD assessment in Eric's presentation, but what I would have liked to have seen was more openness about that assessment. And I was, because there's still so much misinformation, I still see on Facebook so many people who are concerned that Leave Home Safe will invade their privacy, which I think is basically lack of understanding. So I think the third party assessment of the Leave Home Act making that, you know, having more publicity around that to me would be extremely helpful because I, I believe that it is a good act and it's privacy safe, but I think in order to increase trust, it's that third party assessment. It's not just the government saying it's safe, but having the third parties, which I think are, are really important. So I think both, you know, doing things and telling people how you have done them, that, that is very important. Okay, can I switch to Eric now? So, uh, sorry, Hong Kong, you, Eric. So there was a question that came in, I think about asking for a little bit more elaboration about your approach. So I think if, I, if we compare your presentation with the one that Donald gave, right? So he basically compared Leave Home against Apple Google. You only really compared against Apple Google. So I guess how does your approach fit relative to those two? Uh, does it address the problems that Donald identified in the sense that if you have a hot spot, then there's nothing much you can do about it? Thank you. Yes, that's the, the, the general idea is actually, as Donald pointed out, the Google Apple um, contact tracing, when two phones are communicating to one another, you have no idea where in the world they are. They're just sending a Bluetooth um, signal between the two. Um, and it's coded. So that coded signal also doesn't know the identity of this phone nor the identity of this phone. Um, it's a rotating uh, identifier. So every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they send different identifiers and they memorize them. But you have no idea where in the world they are. It occurred to us if that's happening between two phones that are mobile, that are always moving, if you have even just a third phone that never moves, it mm -hmm. just stays in the space, then actually it can keep passing the signal, these two phones pass it to the third phone that never moves. Then actually, um, if those phones disappear, this phone that gets notified because one of the two phones was a COVID case, then we know where it happened. And all of this works just with Google and Apple. Uh, it's just the expense, the added expense of having that third phone because uh, phones are expensive. So instead of having a third phone, you could, and that would actually be an easy way to deploy it uh, citywide, especially because a lot of people have an extra cell phone that they could leave in a space. So if we had Google, Apple contact tracing and, or exposure notification is what it's called now, sorry. I, I use the old original name um, because I was involved even before it came out um, with, with it. Uh, so, I, I, I'm more attuned to the original name than the, the new name. Uh, but Google, Apple, exposure notification, um, if we had it in Hong Kong, you could essentially drop a, a third phone that just lives in the space. And if that phone goes off, you know it was something that was coming through the space. So this, this might be a solution for small businesses, such as small restaurants, then stick an old phone permanently in their restaurant and use that as, as essentially a geo-reference. Have I, have I got the right concept? Correct, and it's completely privacy preserving because the phone will get notified if it um, was a space of contact. However, it won't have any idea what phone it traced back to, which one. Oh. So, so in this example, if I had two phones here and have the third phone just sitting in the space, one of the phones, uh, they're always passing identifiers, which you have no idea which phone is passing which identifier. But if it goes off, you, you, you uh, upload it to the hospital authority uh, or the health authority. The health authority then uh, transmits it across to all devices. And if it sees that it had seen one of those uh, go off, then this one will go off and then you know exactly where it was. But this phone is rather expensive. 
Uh, so we're just using very inexpensive hardware that does the same thing. But, but, I, but my guess would be that most people uh, have old phones sitting around which they don't really use anymore. So for example, a restaurant could stick a phone on their entrance, which is displaying the QR code, but is also the beacon for the geolocation. Is that yeah, you wouldn't need the QR code. So the, the, my two, um, forgive me, but my two criticisms okay. of the Leave Home Safe app would be, um, one is that if you have multiple very inexpensive devices, um, such as old cell phones, and you have a location like a restaurant, you could drop in two or three of them in the restaurant. And a lot of people in Hong Kong have old phones. I've been asking. No. A lot of people have more than one device and all you need is Bluetooth in your device and you can plug it in and you could drop two or three in a larger, rather large restaurant. Um, and my point was simply that, that, you know, if you don't want to give up the QR code as the start point, it could be your QR code display as well as your Bluetooth. Yeah, it could be a QR code, but I was about to return to the QR uh, code as a concept. So with right. QR code, you have to, um, I've been seeing it, people man the door and they make sure that you fill out the form or someone scans in the QR yeah. code. You have to do that quite manually. The nice thing about the Google Apple is it trades it in the background all the time. In fact, I downloaded in my own phone, the Irish app, um, because we don't have it in Hong Kong. And so all the time, every few seconds, it's trading uh, with whoever else has the Irish app, um, or, or it doesn't actually you don't need the Irish app. It's trading the identifier all the time, basically. Um, so you don't have to remember to scan it in. Um, it just is always doing it in the background. Right. So, so I mean, some of the restaurants, small restaurants, were complaining about the difficulty of customers who write down Mickey Mouse, uh, uh, um, you know. As, as their name and they, they write down the Disneyland as their address, right? So, so this presumably would be an alternative. You could say in a restaurant, uh, you know, we will, do a, we will do this anonymous Bluetooth communication with your phone if you come in, instead of requiring you to scan the QR code. Is that, if I understood the concept? Correct. And also in the Leave Home Safe app, um, I can go into the app now and look at all the different places I've been to Sure. Uh, but that also means other. So this would be essentially an extension of the Leave Home Safe app as a start point, which would be instead of scanning a QR code uh, for some locations, I could just simply allow my phone to do the Bluetooth connection to these known locations. I uh, would right? see it as a, a different approach. Like I think I think it, it buys into the Google Apple approach, right. but just adds a way to participate so we get the location is really okay. how I see it. So at, least, um, so at least the Department of Health would still be able to do something about hotspots. Yes, exactly. It, it would know where, where it is. It just wouldn't know who exactly went through there. Um, okay. Any, anybody? So I, I'm not trying to put Donald or Danny on the spot. If you want to comment, that's fine. Actually, uh, Professor, I, 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 have, I, have, I have some immediate questions and, and, sure. and, and observation. First of all, I, I think uh, uh, Professor Eric and and our department's thinking are uh, basically aligned in terms of that the Google and Apple framework has its deficiency in terms of the spatial element. Mm -hmm. So we are all finding a way, try to address this spatial element, right? And uh, the, the difference is that the, uh, the suggestion made by uh, Professor Eric is based on the Google Apple framework. And while our, in our case, are, are based on our self build a QR code mechanism. And uh, some immediate questions are about the, the uh, suggestion by Professor Eric is that, uh, I think someone will definitely ask uh, who owns the first phone? Who will be responsible to upload or to uh, upload the, or, or, to, or to initiate a sharing of signal of contact with other person. For example, in, in case if uh, a restaurant uh, use this kind of uh, uh, pro proposed uh, way to do the notification, mm -hmm. then who owns that phone, first of all? If the government owns that phone, then there will, of course, uh, there will some criticism arise that, okay, oh, so, this mean, phone is, is owned by government. Yeah, so I they can know our, know our whereabouts. 
And well, I, I don't think that's going to work. But I mean, I think I think Eric's thinking, as I understand it, which I, I support, is essentially you've got a situation where restaurants are complaining about the difficulties of, of their current situation from their perspective. So we're trying to offer something yes, which yes. is easier for them. Uh, and essentially all they do from their perspective is in effect using the Apple Google framework. It's just that, that by pre-registering that particular phone with a location, right, just that phone having the pre-registration, then that enables them to do to be allowed to do that instead of the QR code. I guess that's that's what I would be thinking of. Yes, uh, but uh, just in case if if there's someone in 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 fact uh, that happens to uh, appear in that location, right. so that first phone will should receive a signal yep. from the infected person in case he he is willing to share sure. that he was infected. Then you, uh, I mean, you need whatever happens. You need yes, the yes. to be aware. But right? but the first phone also needs to do something. Yes, sure. he also needs to issue a an alert and signal to others that come into uh, uh, who happens to be in that particular places as well. But my question is, who is who will be responsible to issue that alert? Well, I, I, the owner of that restaurant. No, no, yes, no, no, no. I, my assumption, is, Eric can correct me, is that is that the DH would know that, right? Because that's a registered, it's a phone registered as a geolocator for that restaurant. So in the same way that you're registering for the QR code, the alternative is you register the phone for your restaurant. Yes. Right? So you so, mean so that the, the, the Department of Health is has to ask the owner of that uh, 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 restaurant, please issue the signal using well, that phone, let, right? Let me make a few corrections and, and observations. Um, so yes, the, the, like the system that we're uh, thinking about is very privacy preserving, meaning that it would have to be the owner of the phone um, in the restaurant. And, and let's just use that analogy. I think it's a good analogy. So in essence, the owner of that phone would then have to announce in some format that the phone has um, uh, been uh, uh, notified. That phone also received an alert. How that happens, though, could be um, multiple ways. One way is to say this is the address of the restaurant, and you know, just to make sure that everyone um, it is a notifiable disease. So to make sure that um, the health authority uh, puts it on the map. Uh, the second is it is a notifiable disease. So the person is the legal responsible person to notify that I went to that restaurant. I think it lands on the person who does have COVID to release that information. And I haven't studied this at depth. And part of the study, we also want to do a legal sort of overview of this as well. We haven't gone to that stage yet, um, but this would be the next stage um, to do. To do. Uh, but also I think the restaurant owner, if the phone uh, is alerted, could also decide, I don't want to release my address. Um, because it's the phone that's been notified and not the person. Um, and therefore, but they might, they can still send the signal to all the phones that that phone had seen at a lesser, at a lesser level. Right. Um, just like the Google Apple contact tracing is already doing. That's why it's privacy preserving. So think about the most extreme case. The most extreme case is, uh, in my opinion, and this is where actually the thinking starts, is something that's illegal. So someone who's doing something illegal is not going to register for Leave Home Safe um, for their illegal okay. activities. But they might put a phone, if it's all the phones in that space or participating in the Google Apple, because then they have the control of the situation. And of course, the illegal activities are very slim. There's, there's so few illegal activities. But if you're trying to come up with a system that really tries to reach fully all aspects of society, I think we actually have to take into account yeah, all so, aspects. So, so, that, so if you like the unregistered one, so that I, I'm not sure the amount of illegal activity is that small. I mean, I think we know that the government has busted a number of illegal bars and restaurants, right? That have been operating without social distancing and have been operating outside the official hours. So I have no difficulty with, if you like, the fully privacy preserving version as an option for those people, because again, even if even if they still have some interest in warning their customers if they've been exposed. But I think the 
the notification part, I agree entirely. I mean, it seems to me, in effect, what we're saying is the alternative for a restaurant in future might be instead of putting up a QR code, you put a registered phone at the entrance of your restaurant, right? Or, or, or your gym or whatever else we're talking about. So that we provide a, a technically superior, technologically superior solution that is still privacy preserving. And, and it, if you like leverages both the benefits of Leave, of the leave, uh, leave Home app and, and the, the advantages of the Apple Google framework uh, while addressing some of each of their shortcomings, right? Yeah. I mean, so let me be clear. I, I really appreciate the Leave Home app and I use it all the time. I use it sure. all the time. Yes. So, so but, I really deeply appreciate that that effort has been made. Yeah. I'm I, just trying I, to I think it is a good start, cases. but I think, uh, again, we all recognize that that you did it under extreme time pressure and you needed to do a privacy assessment. So the question is really about whether we can do better for next time or when the virus comes back again, if it's simply that with mutation, it comes back every year, right? Clearly we're gonna to need to find better solutions than the ones we already have. So could, could I add one thing to the conversation? Yes, please. Uh, the influenza, the common cold actually travels much the same way the coronavirus does. It also has, um, one of the studies that was done uh, recently just for the US, it had $11.2 billion a year impact um, was the, the estimated average annual total economic burden of the common cold to the mm -hmm. US economy. It also results between 12,000 and 61,000 deaths a year in the US. No one is going to set up a, like a QR code system <laughs> Uh, to scan in on the common cold because we just we just take that 11.2 billion dollar us dollar hit every year in the us um, and accept the 61 thousand uh, dollar 61 thousand um, deaths annually however with this system if it is in the background and it is automatic that's a smarter city because if you have a strain of influenza you could actually notify the system and then the risk of me uh, in a common cold, I think is rather low. But if I was older, say I was in my 90s, oh, I might actually take much- do you mean more... seasonal flu rather than the common cold, Eric? Oh, sorry, seasonal flu. Yeah, yeah. because seasonal flu does kill a lot of people. And actually there are similar issues in the sense of whether people bother to do the vaccination. Yeah. Right? So, so I agree. I mean, I think if in effect, so the fascinating thing was there was a report, I don't know if this is the same one you're talking about, which said that the number of deaths from flu has dropped drastically in the last 12 months, because thanks to, to people dist social distancing and using masks, the risk of infecting others through, through influenza has dropped dramatically. Yeah. Now, what that didn't mention, of course, is I, and I'm not sure is, is to what extent people have done their seasonal flu vaccination this year. I think some people of my age all went and made sure they got their seasonal flu vaccination because the most scary thing would be to get both seasonal flu and COVID together, right? But I think, again, the, the point is, this is a broader concept, right? How can we generally address infectious diseases where some degree of distancing and notification can help to reduce the risk, right? And particularly if we can drive the cost down using very low cost add-ons to what we already have, which is smartphones, to reduce the, the number of deaths. I mean, again, it's again very tricky because the people who die from influenza often are people who would have died fairly soon anyway, right? So it's a little bit tricky. It's not actually just about deaths. It's about the deferral of deaths. How much are you bringing deaths forward or, or later? Anyway, there were two other questions. So I want to bring the other Eric into the conversation because one of the questions was um, essentially about the data protection ordinance. You made some reference to potential changes. So I guess the question is, to what extent can we leverage the data protection ordinance uh, in Hong Kong uh, to, to maximize the benefit for Hong Kong? So, you know, how, how is this played into this or how can it play into generally the issue of sharing data, not just spatial data, and not just virus data, but I think those are the obvious contexts. Thank you, John, for relaying this question to me. Um, but before 
answering that question, uh, can I go back a little bit uh, to the Leave Home Safe app? Sure. Um, I must say that um, it's not an easy task for the government to develop uh, this Leave Home Safe app within such a, a short period of time during these difficult times. And to be able to come up with an app that is easy to use, easy to explain, and um, trustworthy. So uh, as I said in my presentation, my pre-recorded presentation, uh, based on the examination of the key features of the app, uh, the PCPD uh, considers that this, this app, um, speaking from the perspective of uh, personal data protection, is generally in line with the um, uh, personal data privacy ordinance uh, for the for the various reasons I have mentioned. And uh, going back to the question that you have mentioned, John, um, well, um, I think you will all agree that um, a suitable and appropriately drafted data protection law will be able to protect the personal data rights of the individuals, which is um, the fun uh, some of the fundamental rights of individuals. And um, we believe that um, with ethical um, use and collection of personal data and with the compliance with the uh, personal data protection law by the organizations, um, people will have uh, more, more trust in organizations in using uh, their personal data, which in turn will facilitate the making of a smarter city. Um, and I'm sure that many of you will know that um, actually the Hong Kong government and our office have been looking into the possibility of amending or updating the current uh, personal data privacy ordinance in order to make it to keep in pace with times. Um, among other things, um, as the chief executive of the Hong Kong government has publicly stated, um, priority will be given to consider amending or strengthening the law in order to protect people from being doxxed, uh, which is the act, the malicious act of using people's personal data without the data subjects or the data users concern, uh, consent, uh, mainly on the internet, uh, in order to attack or maliciously uh, damage people's reputation and in particular to cause psychological harm to the um, data subjects concerned. Um, so uh, that will be one of the priorities of um, uh, the, amend the possible amendments to the law. And also uh, the government and our office have also been looking into some other aspects to uh, step up protection of personal data privacy, namely, well, actually currently there is not uh, a requirement under the law for organizations which have experienced data breaches to notify our office or to notify the data subjects uh, affected. Uh, so we have been looking into the poss possibility of uh, introducing a, a, a mandatory notification system, uh, which is important in the sense that timely notification can enable our office to help the organizations concerned to minimize the potential damage or harm to the people concerned. And notification to the data subjects concerned can also serve as um, a timely alert for the people, for them to protect themselves uh, in a timely manner. Uh, another aspect that we are looking into in this legislative uh, review is to introduce a system whereby our office can impose financial penalty administratively instead of taking all the trouble and time to go to the court to seek compensation. So um, these are some of the areas that we have been looking into to strengthen uh, personal data protection um, in general and in, and in particular. Thank you very much. So I mean, in fact, the, the one that comes to my mind, of course, is the cafe uh, data breach, right? Where ironically, 
uh, although Cathay is a Hong Kong company, they, they had to report to the UK regulator, but not to you. And the UK regulator could find them and you couldn't, right? Now, whether, of course, the irony is at the moment, the government's been giving Cathay money rather than taking it from them, but that's another story. Uh, anyway, I think that, that's extremely, can I lead that into another question mode for, for Eric? Because somebody asked us about what are the benefits of storing data in Hong Kong? So maybe, let, why don't we talk about specifically as regards data protection principles, how that leads into benefits of storing data in Hong Kong? Well, actually, uh, under the current uh, personal data protection law, uh, personal data is not required to be stored in Hong Kong. Um, the protection afforded by the current law is that if personal data, the processing, the collection, the handling, the holding of personal data um, is controlled by someone in or from Hong Kong, then the personal data protection law applies. So that's a quite um, uh, wide coverage of protection uh, currently. But uh, as you can envisage, um, actually uh, for personal data, which is controlled uh, outside Hong Kong, uh, it is not governed by the current uh, data protection law. So um, that, that's an, 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 a different issue then. Okay, let, let me change track for a moment. There's a couple of questions which I think maybe Danny, these are relevant to you. Uh, one question, I'm gonna put them together for you to answer. So one was basically about alternatives to the um, building ID uh, or geo address, which is somebody said there is an international approach which relies on three meter grids, three meter square grids whether you had considered something like this as the alternative. And then the other question, which I think you're the only person who maybe could comment on is, is about um, satellite data. So the extent to which Hong Kong government either has or should be getting access to satellite data that we could use uh, openly. Danny, did you hear me? Okay, uh, well, we, well, at this moment, we only address focus on the geo address and the building sensor ID. Uh, we haven't have a uh, another a look at other system like like the was three words something like that. Yeah. So yeah. I assume that you could easily map between yours and the three meter square grid system. Is that right? Yeah, I understand. This is the theory behind. Yeah. So so what about what about the satellite data? Is this something that the government? you think needs to consider or has considered? Is there anything you can tell us about any plans for satellite data? Well, I think the satellite data is very useful for us to building up a smart city. Well, in fact, our department has been using satellite data to make maps long times ago. And uh, last year, we also make use of the satellite map uh, to make, to, to produce the uh, imagery map API and is also opened to the public in December last year. So I think the map, the satellite image is, is very useful. And in other country, they, um, because of the coverage of the area, they significantly make use of the satellite map in many area like the uh, disaster response. Uh, they will use the set uh, the image for assessing the damage from, from the disaster, like the hurricane or, or forestry fire, something like that. So I think the satellite image data is very important and uh, we will still exploring how to use it. In so the, is is uh, any of this satellite data available as open data or does it require considerable amounts of money in order to access currently? Okay, for the satellite data that we use, we actually make use of the NASA, the Landsat data, and we, we manipulate the data, in, incorporate it to produce the image map API. So, so is we, that data available openly or it yeah, requires it's paying a fee? It's open. And also the NASA, the, the Landsat data is also open to the public as well. So, so I guess the only question would be, does that mean that we could place some of this in data.gov? Donald, is this the sort of 
is it possible that if this paper is open, we could put the yeah. local part of it in yeah, data.com? You, you, yes, you can go to our geodata store, um, geodata data store, geodata right. store, um, and you can download actually free type, to, uh, consume free type of uh, map API, like the topographic map API, the imagery map API, and the label map API. Yeah, it's open to for to the public. But that that's not directly the satellite data. That's basically your processed version of the satellite data. No, the satellite data. What? Well, uh, well, the imagery map API make use of the satellite data. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. The okay. Let me come back to the other Eric. So Hong Kong, you Eric. There was a question about whether the the sort of the the beacon in a restaurant type idea can be extended to other situations such as say minibuses and buses traveling around because transport is again a big deal right that i think that was one of the challenges for the department of health uh because it doesn't it's not really addressed by leave home safe is it i don't so, know whether eric or, or donald wants it to comment a little bit about uh, it. perhaps you know, i can i can i can give a little bit of information about the sure. uh, upcoming development of leave home safe as you can uh, 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 see from the news, uh, actually we are uh, partnering with Hong Kong U, but another department in, in, in researching on how to make use of this kind of concept like a BLE beacon right. and installed on some public transportation. Now, uh, we are actually trying to do some proof, proof of concept uh, in terms of uh, installing this kind of beacon in some mini, mini green mini vans and try to automate the uh, check-in process in, so that this can help to uh, enhance the user experience. So, but uh, we are, as I understand from my other colleague re re responsible for the initiative, uh, there are some uh, 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 challenges that we need to figure out. For example, uh, uh, how to do the automatic check-in uh, because it may happen that there, there is a mini van just just comes by when I, when we are standing on the on on the street and then will this be automatically checked in for me <laughs> and sure. this kind sure. this kind of uh, uh, litty gritty stuff that sure. we need to sort out. So you don't get accidentally included. Yes. Hong Kong, you Eric, anything you want to say about the the transport context? Yes, I mean there's a there's a few different issues. One is cost. So the the beacon. This is a, a Bluetooth beacon. Um, and so that could work as well because it, it transmits its um, its beacon, and you can you can actually know where this is. And you can stick it to a surface and leave it there. Uh, we also thought about this as well, but uh, this is sort of one way. And also, uh, it will drain the cell phone battery because it's not using Google Apple contact tracing. So, from a point of view of using the beacon with a phone, that's very um, Google and Apple are quite against it uh, because it also ties you to a place. Um, and so that has limitations because of Google and Apple. Uh, because this one trades, uh, sorry, this is the, the mobile phone version, the inexpensive mobile phone version. Um, this one acts just like a cell phone. So Google and Apple think this is a cell phone uh, because it's trading um, ephemeral identifiers every few minutes, this one changes its identifier. Only the owner of this, it could be the bus company, would know if this one goes off and it works in the background at a very low power. So this is already, I've had this on for months on the, using the Irish app um, and trading with devices like this for months. And it has no real noticeable hit on the battery power of my cell phone uh, because it, it abides by the Google Apple rules. Um, therefore it works in the background, but it still does the job and it does the job actually quite invisibly. And then you could place, because this is only about, I mean, the hardware itself is 10 US dollars, but with the, the card and the power, let's just call it $25. You could place this on a double decker bus. You could place one on the upper deck or the lower deck. Right. Um, then you would know, was there a transmission on the upper deck or lower deck? You could place it in the MTR. Um, you could also place it. Um, you could basically put one in every carriage of the MTR. Yes, and so you would know that it was that carriage in the MTR that had a problem as well. Um, that that doesn't address the issue about when you're walking through the station, though, presumably. 
Uh, I mean, you could put one at the door of the station too, but I think it's more where people are for a longer time. Also, because these rotate every 10 to 15 minutes, you also know, you know, it's actually that, that longer duration you're more worried about anyway. Um, so you would get the signal from the phone to the, the chip and you can see that it's coming in over 15 minutes um, and it keeps updating all the time. It's always refreshing. It's just how much you want to hold on to. And again, this one does not know who the person is. It's trading um, IDs so it doesn't tie it to a person and these IDs are ro rotating. So it's really safe as a person to use almost everywhere. Um, and by the way, this is half the equation. I, I only described half because it's, it's a little bit more fine tuned, but there's another half to the equation actually allowing us to, to scan spaces, upload them for epidemiologists as well, but that's a whole different conversation. So I'll leave it out, um, but it's a bit more- I, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes at the end, Eric, to, to wrap up okay. anything else you wanna say. So I, I just, we're almost out of time. I just wanna ask one last key question. So this is for all the panelists can have a say on this. So the question was actually, what are the three immediate things the government can do to, to make a difference, right? I don't think it has to be three. I think maybe we can each come up with one thing that we would like the government to do. So for the people from the government, you don't have to say what the government can do. You can say what, what the society should do or what the private sector should do, right? So just what one thing that you think would make a big difference in our ability to, to use and share data for, for public benefit. So uh, who would first, like first? Let me, let me start first. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, uh, just some of my, some of my, my, my thoughts. Uh, uh, just to set a scene, since, since, since the opening up of the uh, uh, estimated time of arrival data from the public transportation in back in 2019, uh, actually, we've seen a substantial increase of data download and API access to the open data portal. I think this is a very good sign. And, and to date, we have already around uh, per month, around 600 million data download and also 400 million of API access, uh, many of which are related to the, uh, uh, the estimated time of our arrival data and the weather data. So. Uh, uh, with the upcoming opening up of the uh, estimated time of our uh, data of the uh, KMB, as well as 70 li lines of uh, green uh, mini bus, I think it is a, 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 a good opportunity to further attract the interests of the public and the industry of consuming open data for the, for the use. And this may well serve as the tipping point to uh, on the open data landscape in Hong Kong. This is the point, my, my first point. And well, also- I, I think one, Donald, because I want to let everyone else- Okay. One, okay? Who, who wants to go next? Eric? Um, can I, yeah. Eric? Yeah, um, just one uh, quick point. Um, as you all will agree, uh, transparency uh, dispels myths, transparency, also enhances uh, trust. So um, when the government uh, is continuing with its various initiatives in opening up data, I think it's important for the government to continue to be transparent about what it has done to protect uh, personal data if and when personal data is involved in the data being opened. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I already gave Donald my example earlier on, right? Release the, the privacy impact statement. Who would like to go next? Um, okay, Danny. This is Danny. Yeah. Yeah, I think that one, just one important thing the government is doing is the, the implementation of the common spatial data infrastructure. Right. I think this is uh, one of the biggest projects about open data because the, the purpose of CSDI is to facilitate the discovering, viewing, and sharing of data openly. So, okay. so I think this is a, an important tipping point. For okay, so, so making the full FCSDI uh, open and public. Yeah. Is yours. Okay. Eric or Chi Lam? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in my aspect, I'm focusing on the not just thing is for the uh, Hong Kong people, so that I find that there is many people suffering for the non-address and the, the delivery not 
not successful because the non-address, you know. So I'm thinking that open data is very good uh, right now and government is trying to release uh, any kind of data to the public, but the enhancement of it is, is um, must necessary for our uh, startup to provide better service for the uh, public. So that uh, the unit building ID is what I'm looking forward to uh, having the big efficiency for the logistic world. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the unit the full rollout of the building ID. Yeah. Correct? Excellent. So Eric, I'm, I'm going to go first because I'm going to hand over to you to have a final wrap up. So my number one, so if anybody has watched my video, you probably can guess that my number one is for the government to implement the two uh, laws, the two new laws, the government records law, and even more importantly, the access to information law, and that they are drafted in such a way as to have a very broad definition of public bodies and a very narrow definition of exemptions. So those are the two things that I think will make the biggest difference. So Eric, you get to, you get to say last, and also you can wrap up anything you want to say about linked to your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, very kind. I, I see ease of use as a really large issue um, for the future as well, um, so that really people can make use of this data. And not just the people who have the technical capabilities, but really the data is uh, very accessible, maybe different formats, uh, so that really this use can, can reach everyone. The largest uh, change, though, I think, is that I'm often in conversations which are very technical and then other realms of conversation where people are very less technical, um, but have very good ideas. And it, what I'm trying to do is actually get the two people together in the room. So I think it's forums like this that are really critical uh, for making sure that these amazing ideas and um, accessibility to data, which I think Hong Kong does so well, uh, reaches a, a wider impact. And I'm trying to think of more ways that we bring people together uh, so especially doctors and, and others from other realms can really start to think about what this data could mean to them. I'm also seeing a huge change uh, through AI. And one of these huge changes is that a lot that used to be done with a lot of conceptual uh, computer power can actually be done now with a machine learning chip on your cell phone, which means that the way our data is analyzed is transformed considerably. And the way that we can utilize data is actually uh, very different than it was even a few years ago. So what I think this means uh, for me uh, and, and for potentially Hong Kong is the way that we, we structure and set up the data um, so that the, 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 the danger behind, the, behind AI is that the privacy is actually the biggest um, impact. And we can see with uh, Clearview AI in the US and other uh, impact of uh, AI on facial recognition, um, that these are very, very powerful systems. And so we also have to be very careful about how those systems um, are allowed and what are the limits of those systems uh, as well. And I think that with AI, it's not just the facial recognition, which is very much in the news or tracking uh, the, the 3D data of your cell phone um, as it connects to the the network, uh, but also even how we walk, our gate data um, is also identifiable. Sorry, Eric, can I just interject for one moment? Because uh, something which I think neither OGCIO or PCPD mentioned is I believe they have an, a common initiative uh, on the fair use of AI, which mm -hmm. should be released later this year. So I think that, that will be, a, I think, an important piece of contact for that conversation. Uh, I'm not going to comment on it. I've seen a, an earlier draft, but I think at least there is some awareness of, of the importance of that. Sorry. I, I, I'm very I, glad to hear yeah. that because I, I think, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a great lover of AI. I think it's very powerful, especially for medical uses. There's am amazing medical uses in the public realm, meaning uh, like health data in the urban sense that we'll be able to gather. Um, from AI, but also on the privacy, there's always that, that tension and that risk um, as well. Yep. Um, and then the largest um, uh, point I want to make is, is I think um, being very future oriented that a lot of the things that we take as sort of common risk uh, today, um, using influenza as a, or COVID as examples, um, these health risks um, that we're living with at the moment 
they're going to come back. I mean, now we've seen all these infectious diseases come back year after year, and we also know influenza has this huge health risk year after year. I think that the way that we use data and make it accessible as Hong Kong is, then allows us to also um, make use of it through time. So a lot of it is being seen as like a snapshot in the moment. Um, and what is really wonderful about the, even the, the COVID data that's coming through is you can track things through time and how clusters grow and shrink. Um, and you can really make use of the data uh, as well. And I think that this opening up the data and being incredibly open to it is, is already, as, as pointed out uh, by Donald, is having a huge impact. I mean, 60 million, 600 million down, uh, downloads is, is incredible. Um, and so that's really transforming um, our city and also the, the region as well. And I'd love for Hong Kong to be the front runner of this, um, of course, with privacy intact. Um, and I think historically it's a city that has a lot of, of, of wealth and it can afford to do so. Um, I think it can be a leading city in this regard uh, in terms of both I mean, media I, and privacy. Hong, Hong Kong has been a leader in, in personal data protection in Asia. So I think, I think there is an opportunity for us to do these things in a safe way. Anyway, I would like to thank all the panelists so much for their presentations and their engagement during the Q&A. I would like to thank all of you who've been listening in. We had over 100 people uh, listening in through most of the, of the two hours. This is a long time. So this has been recorded, the Q&A. So we will place the Q&A on YouTube and we'll make this all publicly available. And we will be, of course, having uh, three other sessions. So if you've registered, you will get the messages from just that or other events. And she's reminded me that I need to ask you, let's see if I can get it. Yes, here we go. There's a, a QR code for feedback. So we value your feedback so that we can try and make sure that our events improve and are even more relevant and useful in future. So please do uh, scan the QR code and give us your feedback. If you don't want to use the form, you can email just using the contact information you've already got from her. And indeed, we look forward to to having many of you back in our subsequent events. So thank you all very much again indeed. And I will now stop the recording. So I will leave the share up. Okay, thank you all very much. And uh, we'll be in touch again. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, bye everyone.